The Pardes Institute of Jewish Studies welcomes Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs to the Pardes Beit Midrash. This is really a terrific honor and a privilege for us to have Rabbi Lord Sachs with us. Uh, in a moment, um, I'm going to ask Leslie Wagner, our board member and longtime friend of Pardes, formally to introduce Rabbi Sachs. Uh, and we owe Leslie um, our thanks because it was through Leslie that this was arranged. So thank you, Leslie, very much. Uh, I learned this morning that um, the Pope tried to get a ticket for this event, and <laughs> he was so upset when we could not accommodate that that he left the country. So, so you're all very fortunate, and the Pope is not. Um, just a word, Rabbi Sachs, about who, who we are, what Pardes is. Leslie will introduce you to Pardes, but I'd like to introduce Pardes to you for just a moment. Uh, Pardes has been around for over 40 years. Uh, we're very proud of our legacy and what we've achieved over the years. Pardes is an open, egalitarian, non-denominational, and most importantly, diverse center for Jewish study. We pride ourselves on the study of Jewish text, principally, if not exclusively. And uh, you come at a very appropriate time in our academic year. Our students uh, who are with us here today, along with some board members and others, uh, are near completion of uh, a year, and in some cases more than a year of study here in Jerusalem. And they're about to embark on a variety of different paths, uh, many, most in North America, but not exclusively. Uh, and we're very proud of them and very proud to have you here to um, send them off into the world. A little bit about logistics. Uh, Rabbi Sachs will speak for a little bit, maybe 45 minutes, maybe a little less. And then we'll open the floor to questions. And our dean, David Bernstein, has kindly agreed to moderate the question and answer period. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Leslie Wagner, who will introduce Rabbi Lord Sachs. Thank you, Michael. Uh, as you said, it's an honor for Pardes, and it's certainly a privilege for me to be able to introduce uh, Rabbi Lord Sachs. Uh, I've had this privilege before, and I know how difficult it is, because to try and do justice to Rabbi Sachs' achievements would require the introduction to be longer than the talk. So I'm going to be very brief and pricey. Uh, as most of you know, uh, Rabbi Sachs was the chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of uh, Britain the Commonwealth, uh, he was there for, for 22 years, 1991 to 2013. Now, you don't just wake up one day and become chief rabbi, so there's a record of achievement even before that. But let me concentrate on the chief rabbinate. For those of you not from the UK, I think most of you may wonder what the chief rabbi does, um, but he has a very busy life, um, both in being a spokesman for the community and within the community, uh, dealing with halachic issues through his bet din, uh, supporting his rabbis, visiting communities. This is a very, very full-time job, and yet uh, Rabbi Sachs was able, during those 22 years, virtually to write a book virtually every year or every other year. Uh, and just some highlights of those books to draw to your attention. The first I would uh, draw your attention to was Will We Have Jewish Grandchildren, published in 1993, which is uh, 21 years ago, so I think it's referring to our students here, will we have Jewish grandchildren? Uh, and his answer in the UK was to set up an organization called Jewish Continuity to make sure that answer was yes. Um, later, in, uh, at the end of the decade, he produced a book called Radical Then, Radical Now, published in the USA as a letter in the scroll, which answered, tried to and did answer the question of why be Jewish. Um, in 2002, his uh, personal response to the events of 9-11 was to write The Dignity of Difference, a controversial book, but also a book that has won many awards and which essentially argued that uh, the unity of God in heaven allows a diversity of ways of reaching him on earth. Um, in 2009, he published a, a book for the Jewish community worldwide called Future Tense, addressing many of the issues which I looked at only recently and unfortunately is still as relevant today uh, five years on as it was then. And then in 2011, 2012, he produced a book called The Great Partnership, 
uh, arguing that science and religion are partners in understanding the world and not competitors and rivals. These are monumental works in their own right and have had a major impact on thinking. But he's also done other more rabbinical things that we know about. One, he, he has produced a, a new translation and commentary of the Siddur, which found its way, uh, most, most people know it as the Koren Siddur, uh, written by him. He has produced uh, a translation and commentary on the Machzorim for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Pesach. Each one of these is monumental works in its own right, uh, re requiring detailed scholarship and work. And to do that while you're at the same time dealing with the problems of being a chief rabbi is really quite remarkable. He's produced his own Haggadah, and he continues uh, now that he has retired from that job to do more writing, the fruits of which we shall see shortly. Uh, since retiring, uh, as well as writing, he has spent quite a bit of time in the USA. He is at the moment a visiting professor at Yeshiva University and New York University. And those of you students who are going back to the States and are in New York will have the opportunity of hearing him if you visit or attend those institutions next year. So all that means that Robert Sachs is a remarkable individual and we're absolutely delighted that on his very busy schedule, no, no, schedule, I'm sorry, we're in America, I forgot. <laughs> we're in America these days, right. Uh, they're busy scheduled. Um, he has found time to come to us in Pardes and now ask him to speak to us. Rabbi well, Sachs. <clears throat> Michael, Leslie, friends, thank you so much for those lovely words and thank you for the privilege of being able to be here with you in Pardes, a wonderful, wonderful institution with great teachers and you, an extraordinary group of students. I think both of my daughters spent time studying here. My brother Elliot, who lives in Yerushalayim, has spent time studying here. I may even have taught here, I'm not sure. Did he teach here at all? He certainly sat here and learned. And this is a really, really wonderful place. Um, strange things happen to you in Yerushalayim. You know, Hashem parachutes in various angels whom you meet uh, out of the blue. And we were walking on the Tayelet a few days ago, and a complete strange, I mean, no one around. And out of nowhere materialized uh, an elderly French Jew who saw me, came straight up to me, knew who I was, and posed one simple question. He said, how come the rabbis have managed to turn the most beautiful religion into the, in the world into something so ugly? <laughs> Which was a good question, really. And I took it that that was Hashem speaking, and therefore, let me issue a challenge to you. If you have found something of true beauty here in Yahadut, in Yerushalayim, Mirai Kodesh, in your teachers, in any of your experience, go back home and take that fragment of beauty with you and use it to transform your communities or your circle of friends, or even just your own life. Cling hold to that fragment of beauty, because this really is a religion bigger, greater, and more lovely than we have sometimes allowed it to be. Michael, you mentioned the Pope. I will tell you a little story uh, about his predecessor. I have to say, you know, I became the first chief rabbi to retire before the age of 70, a couple of months after I announced my retirement, the Archbishop of Canterbury announced his retirement, the first Archbishop of Canterbury ever to retire before time. And then, lo and behold, Pope Benedict XVI. <laughs> so I said to Rome Williams, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, who retired, I said, Rome, we seem to have started a trend. He said, yeah, we have, and I'm worried about the Dalai Lama next. <laughs> But one of the more interesting moments I had was in 2010, September, when I was when Pope Benedict the 16th, his pre, the predecessor of the present Pope, visited Britain, and I was asked to welcome him on behalf of all the 
non-Christian faiths in Britain. And the day he came was Erev Yom Kippur, which was a little difficult. You know, it was the day of Kol Nidre night. And it was in the afternoon. Not easy. And lo and behold, here we are, mentally getting ready for Kol Nidre. And here appears a pope wearing a white yarmulke <laughs> and a white robe, a white kittel. And I claim my reward in Olam Haba when the time comes that I did not say, Good Yantif Pontif. <laughs> As we say that. Guys, you've asked me to speak a little about Jewish particularism. And therefore, let me begin with this story about one of the great souls of my time, if not of yours, the late Shlomo Kalbach, who taught the Jewish world how to sing. And Shlomo Kalbach spent a lifetime going around university campuses and being the warm and generous soul he was. He never only spoke to Jewish students, he spoke to students of all kinds. And after a lifetime of experience, he said this. <clears throat> he said, when I ask students, what are you? And somebody says, I'm a Catholic, I know that's a Catholic. If they say, I'm a Protestant, I know that's a Protestant. If they say, I'm just a human being, I know that's a Jew. And that is the story of Jewish identity in our time. I remember Jackie Mason, the com comedian, who used to begin his routine back in the 60s, long before he was famous, with one of the greatest lines I ever heard. He said, I may start slowly, but little by little, I die out completely. <laughs> and Jackie Mason used to say, they all laugh at my jokes, and then they say, Mwah, too Jewish. So that is the issue. We're embarrassed to be too Jewish. We're embarrassed to be different. To be a Jew is to suffer, as it were, a permanent identity crisis, which has precedence, because if you look at what Moshe Rabbeinu's first question to God was, what was it? His second question to God was, who are you? But his first question was, mi anochi, who am I? And, of course, Moshe Rabbeinu had an identity crisis because he grew up as a prince of Egypt. He spent his adult life as a shepherd in Midian. And, therefore, when God asked him to lead the Jewish people, he asked, who am I? So identity crises go all the way back. They go back to Yosef. They go back to Yaakov. They go all the way back. And I don't find this so often among Christians or Muslims or Hindus or Sikhs or Zoroastrians, when was the last time you met a Zoroastrian with an identity crisis? It is something that we suffer from, and I want to know why. And I began thinking about this some time back. And I found myself searching for an answer in the early chapters of Torah. Because it's how the Jewish story that begins that's really interesting. And I was struck immediately by something very obvious and very strange indeed. And it is this. What is Torah about? What is Tanakh about? It is about a people and a land. It is about two individuals, Avram and Sarah, and their family, which became an extended family, which became a tribe, which became a collection of tribes, which became a nation. And virtually the whole of Tanakh is about a journey, once in the days of Abraham, another time in the days of Moses, all the way to our own time. The journey to a specific place, Eretz U Medinat Yisrael. So the Torah is a particularistic book it doesn't speak about all humanity. It speaks about one particular section of humanity. It doesn't speak about the whole world. It speaks about one specific place in the world. And yet, the Torah doesn't begin that way. That is what is odd. It begins with a purely universal set of narratives. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, 
Noah and the flood, Babel and its builders. And only with the 12th chapter of Bereshit do we hear the first recorded syllables of Jewish time, Lech lecha, me'artzecha, me'moladetcha, me'bet avicha, el ha'aretz ha'she'areka. How come that line is delayed for 12 chapters? What are the first 11 chapters about? And it seems to me pretty clear that if we look at the first nine chapters, from the creation of the world out of chaos and void, tohu vavahu, to the recreation of the world after the flood, one to nine are a self-contained unit which end with God making a covenant with all humanity through Noah. Those are self-contained. They're understandable. And therefore, the real shift from wide angle to close up, the explanation must lie in Genesis 10 and 11. What is Genesis 11 about? It's about the Tower of Babel. And we all know the story, or at least we think we know the story. It's a story about a people, about humanity, who commit a sin. What is the sin? They build a city and a tower that would reach heaven. And the result is they fail to observe the principle that Hashomayim Shamayim Lashem Aretz Natan Adam. Heaven belongs to God. It's our job to live down here on earth. And the result is that their tower remains unfinished and becomes a symbol of uh, the failure of hubris, of aiming too high. That is the story as we know it. But actually, if you look carefully at the narrative, That is not the story as the Torah tells it. The Torah regards these details as incidental. The story actually begins with something else completely. The whole land, not the whole earth, the whole land had one language and a shared vocabulary. And the story ends with God confusing their languages. One way or another, this is not so much a story about a tower as a story about language. (coughs) And the one thing we forget when we read Genesis 11 is to think about Genesis 10. Do you know what Genesis 10 is all about? The chapter immediately prior to the Tower of Babel. Anyone know? Yeah? Yeah. Exactly. It's about the division of humanity into 70 languages, exactly so. 70 nations with 70 languages. In other words, the confusion of language already happened before Babel, not after it. If we assume, at least as the Talmud Yerushalmi assumes, that chapters 10 and 11 are in chronological order. You can solve the whole problem by saying... Ein mukdam umoucha batara. The Torah isn't in chronological sequence, but usually it is. Not always, but usually it is. And if we say that, then humanity had already been divided into 70 languages, in which case, what's this story about? Vayhi kol ha'aretz safa achat udvarim achadim. The first thing to note about the Tower of Babel, the whole narrative takes only nine verses. And so it looks like a myth, a parable, an etiological story. But the odd thing is that we have more archaeological evidence for the accuracy of the story of the Tower of Babel than virtually any other story in the Torah. We know that the most striking thing about Mesopotamian city-states was their towers, their ziggurats. Archaeology has discovered some 32 of them around that Tigris-Euphrates valley. There was one particularly big one in a town which for a while was the capital of the region called Ur, Ur Ur-Kastim, where Avram was born. But we know the largest of them was indeed in Babel, in Babylon, 
It was over 300 feet high, and it was, it carried the inscription, archaeologists have found this, that this is Shah HaShamai, this is the gateway to heaven, and therefore this is historically extremely accurate, the realia are extremely accurate. We also know that Mesopotamia, this area in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, was the world's first civilization. And we still carry with it traces. For instance, how many angles in a circle? 360, right? What, how many hours in a day? 24. This is due to the hexadecimal system of Mesopotamia that counted in sixes. And so they were the first astronomers and they divided the heaven into six times 60 angles. They divided the day into six hours before noon, six hours after noon, and a parallel number of hours in the night, hence 24 hours. They invented the calendar. They invented uh, ast accurate astronomy. They invented writing. The first writing ever created was cuneiform in that part of the world. But more consequentially, it was there that something else was born. What was born in Mesopotamia was the world's first empire, created by Sargon, the Akkadian Empire, which conquered all the local city-states. I mean, Italy, for instance, was... Until uh, Garibaldi was a lot of little, uh, what it was called, princedoms and little city-states. And Sargon conquered all those and turned them into the world's first empire. We know, because archaeologists have discovered this in the last hundred years, we have inscriptions from Sargon II and Ashurbanipal II, which read as follows. They tell about how they conquered smaller nations, and they say, and we imposed our language on the nations that we conquered. We, in other words, robbed them of their language, of their difference, of their culture, and we imposed ours on them. And we have this, as I say, as inscriptions from Sargon II and Ashurbanipal II. We also know, although we don't have an inscription to this effect, that that is exactly what Sargon did. He made the whole of that region speak Akkadian. And this is, therefore, what the story of the Tower of Babel is about. The tower itself is only a symbol. But the real issue is imperialism. That is the real story of Genesis 11. The attempt to conquer the world and impose your culture or your religion on the people you conquer. And now we begin to understand how Judaism was born. Judaism was born as a protest against empires and imperialism, against the attempt either to conquer or to convert the world. In effect, what God was saying to Avram Avinu is leave this place, this great empire of Orkastim, of Bavel, of Mesopotamia, leave this empire and go off and create a new kind of society. And a society in a land which on the one hand will always find itself surrounded by empires who want to conquer it. Because Israel is the great strategic location in the Middle East. It is the one place where three continents join. Europe, Africa, and Asia. Every empire must want to conquer Israel. But Israel can never become an empire because it lacks the geography for empire. What do you need if you're going to start an empire? You needed, in the ancient world, some very flat land in which you could have massive populations and huge cities and monumental buildings. That is why the first civilizations 
were in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley and the Nile Delta, you cannot ever found an empire in Israel. In fact, Jews are the only people who ever created a nation state in Israel. Israel has been conquered by almost everyone who ever conquered anything. But no nation ever created a nation state in Israel, only Jews. All, at all other periods, Eretz Israel was an outlying province of a major empire whose center was elsewhere. And what I suddenly realized is that Abraham and Sarah were being told, leave the home of empire and be different in order to teach humanity the dignity of difference. And that is what Judaism actually is. And that, incidentally, is the single deepest explanation for anti-Semitism. If we want to understand anti-Semitism, we have to listen to the first anti-Semite or the first, one of the first anti-Semites, Haman in Megillat Esther, who says these words, Yeshno am echad, there's this one nation scattered among all the nations whose laws are different from anyone else. Jews were hated because they were different. Anti-Semitism is the paradigm case of dislike of the unlike. And you will say every country, every nation is different, and they are. But Jews were the only people who consistently throughout history insisted on the right to be different, the duty to be different, the dignity of difference. They were the only nation throughout history not to convert to the dominant religion nor to assimilate to the dominant culture. And that explains the unique feature of Judaism. That is, and no other religion has this shape, and I include here the two other great Abrahamic monotheisms, Christianity and Islam, who borrowed much from Judaism, but not this. Judaism is the only religion that says, in effect, our God is the God of all humanity, but our religion is not the religion of all humanity. And therefore, that most fundamental principle of Judaism, chasidei umot, you don't have to be Jewish to get to heaven. You don't have to be Jewish to be righteous. You don't have to be Jewish to speak to God. We have extraordinary righteous Gentiles in Torah and Tanakh. We have, well, Noah, of course, the only person in the whole of Tanakh who's called a tzaddik. We have Eov, the most righteous person in the whole, Job, in the most righteous person in the whole of Tanakh who isn't Jewish. We have Yitro, Moses' father-in-law, who teaches him how to lead, who isn't Jewish. And to my mind, the most poignant, and in some ways the most moving of all, Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, here she is, the daughter of the tyrant. She is as far from us as it's possible to be. And it is her courage and her humanity that rescues this child, adopts it, brings it up and gives him the only name by which he is known, Moshe. What was the name of Pharaoh's daughter? We don't know. The Torah doesn't say. But Divrei Hayamim mentions a name, Batya Bat Paro. And Batya, and they said that is the daughter of Pharaoh who saved Moses. And what does Batya mean? It means the daughter of God. And there is a Midrash that I think is incredibly beautiful. And it says, God said to Pharaoh's daughter, even though this child was not your child, you treated it as if it was your child. You adopted it as your child. So even though you are not my child, I adopt you as my child, my daughter. But, yeah, God's daughter. These are righteous people who aren't Jewish. The second thing is, that God speaks. I mean, he's Malkit Tzedek, Abraham's contemporary. Vahu Kohen La'el Elyon. He is the priest of the Most High God, but he isn't Jewish. God speaks to Avimelech, Melech Gerah. God speaks to Lavan. Most remarkable of all, he sends Yonah to Nineveh, to the capital city, or at least the military center 
of Israel's greatest enemy at the time, Assyria. And he sends Jonah to them, them to get them to do tshuva and to save them. Equally remarkable is the story of Abraham himself. In chapter 14 of Bereshit, we see him fighting on behalf of the people of Sodom. He wages war and rescues their hostages. In chapter 18, we see him praying for the people of Sodom in the most audacious prayer in religious history. Hashofet kol haaretz, lo yasem ishpat. So Abraham fights for his neighbors. He prays for his neighbors, but he doesn't become like his neighbors. He remains true to himself, the result of which is when his wife dies, the Hittites, when he wants to buy land, look at him and they say, Nasi Elohim Atab Tolchenu, you are a prince of God in our midst. And that is the meaning of God's statement right at the beginning. First call to Avram. Ve'ye bracha, be a blessing. Ve'nivrechu v'cha, kol mishpachot ha'adama, so that through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. The result is that Judaism is a unique fugue, counterpoint, field of tensions between the universal and the particular. We have a universal form of knowledge, which the sages called Chokhmah. And we have a particularist form of knowledge, which we call Torah. Chokhmah is the truth we discover. And you don't have to be Jewish to discover it. Torah is the truth we inherit. Torah tzivalanu Moshe morasha kilat Yaakov. We have, and of course the sages acknowledge this. And they coined a blessing overseeing non-Jewish sages. Baruch Hashem. Shenatan mechachmato levasavadam. Uh, one that I have made <laughs> over all the Nobel Prize winners I've met. It was actually very moving. Uh, I, I remember a few years ago, sadly he's no longer alive, making that bracha over Seamus Heaney, a wonderful, the great poet, the great Irish poet, and a great Ohev Yisrael. And he, he pointed his lapel badge, which you get when you win the Nobel Prize. You, Okay, so make sure you got room on your lapel, guys. You'll all, you'll get. And, you know, he blushed and he said getting that blessing meant as much to him as getting that, that badge. It was beautiful. But it shows how open-minded the sages were that they coined a blessing over Chachmei Umot Olam. We even have two different names for God. One which is universal and one which is particular. Elohim is a universal name for God. Non-Jews talk about Elohim. Pharaoh, when Joseph interprets his dream, says, Hanim ish asher ruach Elohim bo. Elohim is known to non-Jews as to Jews. Hashem is God's special name when relating to the Jewish people. We have a universal and a particular covenant. The Brit B'nai Noach and the Brit B'nai Avraham and eventually, of course, the Brit Sinai. And the result is, Judaism has these two commands of love. Once we learn to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our might, we are commanded, one, kamocha. you shall love your neighbor as yourself, because if you're living in this part of Jerusalem, your neighbors are pretty much like yourself. But also, 36 times in one form or another, the Torah tells us, love the stranger, because even the stranger is part of the ambit of the command of love, or to put it more simply, if God created all of us in his image, then even somebody who's not in my image, whose color or language or ethnicity or faith is different from mine, is still the image of God. And that is Ahavata Hagia, which allowed me, having made this intellectual journey, to sum up what I see as the Abrahamic imperative, which I sum up in a single sentence. Be true to your faith and a blessing to others regardless of their faith. And I believe that is a remarkable and powerful statement. What it meant was 
Jews never created an empire. Christianity and Islam did create empires. Christianity created two of the greatest empires in history. In the West, the Holy Roman Empire, and in the East, the great empire of Byzantium. Islam created empire after empire after empire, the Umayyads, the Fatimids, the Ottomans, and so on and so forth. And the result was not a happy one if you have read your history. And the real problem Jews had was when they encountered cultures that were purely universalistic. Christianity and Islam were two, but there were two others that were not particularly religious, but nonetheless were universalistic. One, the first was the Hellenistic world, the world of Greece and Rome, which in the days of Antiochus IV attempted to wipe out the practice of Judaism. And under the Romans, especially under the Emperor Hadrian, pretty much massacred almost all the Jews in Israel. So Greece and Rome, known for their enlightenment, were actually among the world's first purveyors of anti-Semitism, among the world's first racists, to be honest with you, because the Greeks believed that every person who was not Greek was not fully human. They were sheep, bar, bar, and hence the Greek word for a non-Greek, uh, the bar, uh, barbaric, bar, the barbarisms, the barbarians. The other one, of course, much more recently, was the European Enlightenment that had no time whatsoever for particularities of identity. And sadly, in the reaction against the Enlightenment, sophisticated Europe gave rise in the 19th century and early 20th century to the worst anti-Semitism there has been, the worst crime against humanity that there has been since Homo sapiens first set foot on earth. It follows, therefore, that the Jewish insistence that we must be both universalists and particularists, that we must engage in the common enterprise of humankind, but we must be able to do so each following that which makes us different, is a vital contribution to civilization. And I do not believe it has ever been as important as it is today in the 21st century. In August of 2000, I had the privilege of being in the United Nations, I had the Zuchus of Lit speaking there with 2,000 other religious leaders from around the world. It was modestly entitled the Millennium Peace Summit. So you can see how successful we really were, you know. <laughs> Less than a year later, we got 9-11, or just over a year later, we got 9-11. It was terrific. But an Indian guru came up to me during that conference and said, Rabbi Sachs, would you please be a keynote speaker at my counter-conference in Delhi? And I said, what's your counter-conference? He said, the World Conference of Non-Evangelizing Faiths. And you have no idea how much that means to Hindus and to Sikhs, and to Indians. You know, the people who get assaulted by Christianity and Islam trying to convert them or conquer them. And our stand here matters a very great deal. So if Bernard Lewis and after him Sam Huntingdon are right that we face in the 21st century a clash of civilizations, it becomes incredibly important to deliver a Jewish message that our humanity is this fugue, this counterpoint between what makes us the same and what makes us different, our commonalities and our particularisms. As I said, once if we were completely different, we couldn't communicate. But if we were exactly the same, we'd have nothing to say. And that is why the Jewish message is important. And I tested this out on non-Jews. Every year, Elena and I would give a reception for the heads of the National Union of Students. So for two years, I gave them a shear on what became known as the dignity of difference. And I could see these Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus walking out of the room an inch taller, and you could write in the words in the think bubble above their heads. You could see them thinking, 
We always knew we were different, but we always thought that was a bad thing. And here's the chief rabbi telling us it's a good thing. And it was lovely. And the University of London students were kind enough in 2004 to put a plaque on the wall of their student union in Gower Street with a sentence from Dignity of Difference, because we are all different, we each have something unique to contribute. <clears throat> which you'll see if you go to London University today. And the truth is, it is our particularity that is our universality. Listen, we know that Shakespeare didn't have a really good literary agent. If he'd have had a really good literary agent, he would have said, Bill, my boy, you, you, you're doing well in England, but the big audience is across the Atlantic. Let's tone down the Englishness a bit. Shakespeare speaks to us because he is the quintessence of what Elizabethan England was. Tolstoy speaks to us because he's the quintessence of the soul of Russia, Monet, and his water lilies, because that is what it was to be French. By being what we uniquely are, we give humanity what only we can give. And that is that lovely tension between universality and particularity that it is at the very heart of being Jewish, and I believe it is a message that can be shared with the world. All I can say is this. There are certain moments I had as chief rabbi that were just so unexpected. <laughs> I was totally astonished by it. I had, pu I had published my book. I hadn't yet published Dignity of Difference, but I published that book um, called A Letter in the Scroll, in English called Radical Then, Radical Now. It was translated into Ivrit, and my brother Alan, who lives here in Yushalayim, has a mischievous sense of humor. And he said, Jonathan, they've just translated your book in Hebrew as Ridiculous Then, Ridiculous Now. Radicali does, Radicali. This is May 2002, and Her Majesty is celebrating her golden jubilee, 50 years as queen, and she gives a tea party in Buckingham Palace for Kol Maminim Shehu. Yep. Oh, thank you. For all the faiths. And towards the end of this gathering, a very, very Haredi Muslim comes up to me and says, are you the chief rabbi? I said, yes. He said, my wife wants a word with you. <laughs> now, I want you to remember May 2002, which you can't, you weren't born yet, but <laughs> May 2002 was the time of a little episode called Jenin when uh, Israel was in quite a bad state and Jewish-Muslim relations were rock bottom. So I was terrified at what she was going to say to me. And she came up to me, a woman with a big hijab, and said, I just want to thank you for your book, Radical Now, Ra Radical Then, Radical Now. There's not one word about Islam in that book. It is a book of Jewish pride. And that was when I realized it. Incidentally, it was serialized in the Times. And I asked the Times was serialized by a, a gentleman called Michael Gove, who was the deputy editor of the Times and now Secretary of State for Education. Sadly, they didn't appoint Leslie Wagner as Secretary of State for Education. He would have been outstanding. But, and I asked this non-Jew in the Times, why are you publishing this book, serializing this book about Jewish pride? And he replied, because you're our chief rabbi. This non-Jew said this. And I suddenly realized that is the power of particularity. If we are proud in our own faith, we lift others to have pride in their faith. And that then becomes very powerful indeed. Or as I summed it up in two sentences in that book, non-Jews respect Jews who respect Judaism. And non-Jews are embarrassed by Jews who are embarrassed by Judaism. So I want to say to you, 
don't feel there is a conflict between being utterly faithful to your identity as Jews and going out there and contributing to the human condition and the human enterprise and doing the Jewish deed. The Jewish deed is that which makes the world that is a little closer to the world that ought to be. It is by being what we uniquely are that we contribute what only we can give. So I give you this blessing. Go out, carry on your studies, go home, and be true to your faith and a blessing to the world. Amen.